Hello and welcome back to another lecture on literary theory. Today we are going to carry forward our discussion on postcolonial literary theory and uh, we are going to do so by focusing on the works of two major theorists, Homi Bhava and Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. In our previous lecture on Edward Said, we have seen how postcolonial theory seeks to delegitimize the Eurocentric grand narrative of colonialism, especially through the technique of contrapuntal reading. In today's lecture, we will see how postcolonialism addresses the question of alternative discourse formations that challenge the hegemony of the colonial grand narrative. Now, if you look back at Orientalism, which is an example of colonial discourse uh, that we had discussed in our previous lecture, you will see that it is pivoted on a notion of essentialism. What do I mean by this? Well, the European colonizer who justified their colonial rule through a discourse like Orientalism, for instance, thought of themselves as inherently or essentially superior. In contrast, the subjugated Orient was looked upon as inherently or essentially inferior. The grand narrative of European colonialism posits that since the native cultures of places like India, for instance, or Africa or Southern America is inferior, the imposition of the quote unquote superior European culture through colonialism acts as an ennobling influence. So, colonialism from within this grand narrative is perceived as a kind of civilizing mission. Now, what is important to note here is that is actually the way in which the quote unquote superior West and the quote unquote inferior East, uh, they act as two sides of a binary, which means that in spite of the colonial contact and cultural engagement, the grand narrative of colonialism perceives the colonizing West and the colonized East as mutually exclusive opposites. That is how we understand binaries, right? Binaries are mutually exclusive opposites. Um, so, in this equation underlying the grand narrative of colonialism, the superior West and the inferior East acts as mutually exclusive sides of the same binary. So, no matter how much the colonizer's culture comes in contact with other cultures, it is assumed that it will retain its essential superiority. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, no matter how much the colonized population tries to quote unquote civilize themselves by adopting the cultural traits of the colonizer, they cannot shed their essential inferiority. Homi Bhabha's intervention in the field of postcolonial theory is marked by his conceptualization of a non-essentialist theory of culture which both undermines the colonial grand narrative and provides a lens through which to identify the dynamics of alternative counter narratives. And the two major ideas that Bhabha foregrounds in this regard are firstly hybridity and secondly mimicry. Uh, we will come to each of these two ideas uh, one by one, but first let me briefly introduce Bhabha to you. Homi Bhabha was born in the city of Bombay in 1949 
and uh, do not confuse this Homi Bhaba with the other famous uh, Indian personality bearing the same name. He was a scientist, he is known for his contribution within the field of literary theory. So, uh, Homi Bhaba, the literary theorist, was born in the city of Bombay in 1949 and he completed his graduation from the Bombay University and then he went on to do his doctoral thesis from the University of Oxford. He started his teaching career in England at the University of Sussex and he is currently a chair professor at the University of Harvard. He is uh, most well known within the field of postcolonial studies for his book titled The Location of Culture, which was first published in 1994. Uh, and it is in fact in this book, this seminal publication, that Baba presents the two crucial concepts of hybridity and mimicry. And so, let us now turn our attention to these two uh, concepts and let us start with the notion of hybridity. As I have uh, stated earlier in this lecture, that the notion of hybridity is pivoted on a non-essentialist understanding of culture, which means that culture is not looked upon as a static entity that remains unchanged irrespective of the context. Rather, culture here is understood through the metaphor of a melting pot, where disparate elements come together to form a whole. But what is important to remember here is that this whole is not a final form, but subject to change and flux. Um, so, for instance, as new elements get incorporated within the melting pot, they keep on getting integrated within the melting pot, the flavor of the cultural whole also goes on changing. It is this mixedness of culture, it is the sense of culture being in a continuous flux, being in a state where new elements continuously gets added to it and keeps changing the identity of the whole. This is what Baba signifies through his concept of hybridity or the notion of cultural hybridity to be more specific. So, uh, to sum it up, cultural hybridity is a non-essentialist notion. In other words, within this framework of understanding culture, there is no notion of an eternal or universal Indianness, for instance, or uh, Africanness or Britishness. Secondly, cultures are regarded as both spatially and temporally fluid, and hybridity understands the cultural landscape as a site of constant intermixing of new and disparate elements. But how does this alternative vision of culture undermine the grand narrative of European colonialism that should concern us? Well, if uh, we follow Bhava and regard uh, culture as a dynamic process that is characterized by hybridity, by mixedness, then the superior slash inferior and self slash other binary underlying a colonial grand narrative like Orientalism, for instance, starts to break down. This is because the talk about a superior West, which represents the colonial self and an inferior Orient, which represents the other, cannot operate without assuming culture as static fixed and unchangeable. So, once the idea of culture as an isolated essence is challenged, the entire edifice of colonialism as a civilizing mission comes crashing down and colonialism in fact is uh, revealed for what it actually is, which is an exploitation of other people's land and resources through brute force. 
Now from hybridity let us move on to the concept of mimicry which uh, presents an account of how the colonized subject punctures the hegemony of the colonial discourse and asserts his or her identity in a way that is quote unquote menacing to the edifice of colonialism. To understand this uh, menace of mimicry that Baba talks about, uh, let us uh, start with the term mimicry, let us try and understand that first. Now uh, the term mimicry has its root in the word mime which is also connected with the Greek concept of mimesis that we have discussed at length in our lectures on Plato and Aristotle. So um, from that discussion of mimesis you will understand that at the most fundamental level mimicry is a form of imitation. But in English language the term mimicry means not only imitation but it actually means something more. There is an added nuance that uh, mimicry conveys in English language and this uh, added nuance is evident for instance in the definition of the term mimicry which we can find in Oxford English Dictionary. In the dictionary mimicry is explained as and I quote the imitation of the speech or mannerisms of another in order to entertain or ridicule. Now the word ridicule is uh, crucial to uh, Bhava's concept of mimicry uh, and we will uh, come to that in a moment but uh, for now uh, let us focus first on the aspect of imitation which is conveyed by the word mimicry. Now if a colonial discourse presents the act of colonization as a civilizing mission, it automatically expects the colonized subject to perform the role of imitators because it argues that it is only by trying to become like the colonizer that the colonized subject would emerge from his state of barbarity. This emergence will however never be sufficient to make the colonized subject exactly like the colonizer because as Baba points out the colonized would forever remain uh, quote unquote not quite not white. But nevertheless the emergence would be sufficient enough to make the colonized subject more civilized and more mature than what he is in the present. Now, if making the colonized subject imitate the colonizer is part of the latter's agenda, is part of the colonial agenda, then how can we understand mimicry as an assertion of agency by the colonized subject because I introduced the concept of mimicry as something that is associated with the assertion of agency by the colonized, right. So how do I explain this because I have just said that um, this idea that the colonized subject should imitate the colonizer was already part of the colonial plan, was already something that we can find within the colonial discourse. Well here the notion of mimicry as ridicule comes to the foreground. So as I told you mimicry is not simply imitation. Mimicry is imitation which also conveys the added nuance of ridiculing the person who is being imitated. Bhava points out that the very act of the quote unquote inferior colonized subject imitating the superior colonizer turns the latter into a subject of ridicule. In other words, the adoption of the colonizer's speech mannerism etc by the colonized subject turns his acts into a sort of mockery of the superior colonizers culture. It becomes if you want to understand this through an example it becomes something like a, a clown picking up the manners of a suave gentleman and then repeating it after him in the most exaggerated and comic manner. It is imitation, yes, 
but it is a form of imitation which also ridicules the subject of imitation. And this comic undermining of the colonizer's position by the colonized through distorted imitation which is mimicry is what Bhava refers to as menacing. He terms this as the menace of mimicry, a menace that undermines the edifice of colonialism. But rather than ridicule through mimicry, can't the colonized subject simply create an alternative discourse for himself or herself? Uh, that is to say, can't the colonized subject simply emerge out of the colonial hegemonic discourse by articulating a different discourse of his or her own? Well, these questions uh, bring us close to Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak's seminal essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, but before we take up that essay and start exploring the concept of subaltern vis-a-vis -vis the question of discourse formation, let me introduce Spivak to you. Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak was uh, born in 1942 in Calcutta and she grew up amidst some of the worst years that this erstwhile capital of the British Raj has ever experienced. The horrific Bengal famine of the 1940s had brought to the streets of Calcutta a multitude of refugees from uh, the neighboring villages and their malnourished and skeletal bodies were seen rotting all over the streets of this metropolitan city in the years leading up to India's independence. This catastrophe was followed by the catastrophe of communal violence that preceded the partition of Bengal in 1947. And these were the years through which Spivak lived, through which she grew and these left indelible traces in her memory and she later incorporated uh, these memories into how she theorized the post-colonial condition. In uh, 1959, Spivak graduated from the Presidency College of Calcutta, which was originally established as the Hindu College, which was in fact the first institution of Western style higher education in the whole of India actually. Uh, subsequently, uh, Spivak uh, went to America where she did her PhD on W.B. Yeats from Cornell University under the guidance of the famous deconstructive literary critic Paul Deman. And currently she is um, a university professor which is sort of the highest ranking professor at the Columbia University in New York. But interestingly, in one of her latest books uh, titled An Aesthetic Education in the Era of Globalization, she not only introduces herself as a professor at Columbia, but she also introduces herself as a trainer of elementary school teachers in West Bengal. And this particular aspect of her career is important because uh, as we will soon see, this relates to her efforts to create enabling conditions for the subaltern to speak. But let us first try to understand what or who is a subaltern uh, because this concept of the subaltern is at the heart of Spivak's major essay, Can the Subaltern Speak, which incidentally was first published and there are a number of versions of this essay that are available, but it was first published, the first version of this essay uh, was published in 1985 in a journal called Wedge. So, the term subaltern is originally derived from the language of the military where it is used to signify a junior ranking army officer. But this term gained currency within the field of uh, contemporary intellectual discourse after um, the Italian scholar, Marxist scholar Antonio Gramsci uh, used it in his writings to signify a section of people who were subordinate to the 
hegemonic groups or hegemonic classes. As you will know from our earlier discussion of Gramsci's idea, hegemonic class refers to that group of people within a society who exercises its control over the rest of the society through non-coercive means and by creating consent. Now, within the Gramscian framework, the section of the population that is led and controlled by the hegemonic class is the subaltern. So, in other words, society, according to Gramsci, is primarily divided into two groups of people. The hegemonic group who exercise political power and agency and the subaltern group which is led by the former, which is led by the hegemonic class. And uh, they are led by the hegemonic class uh, because the subaltern group is taken in by the illusion that their self-interest is reflected in the self-interest of the dominant class, of the hegemonic class. Now, this Gramscian definition of the subaltern was uh, very powerfully adopted by a group of Indian historians who came to prominence during the 1980s and who were known uh, by the name uh, Subaltern Studies Collective. The leading figure in this Subaltern Studies Collective was Ronujit Guho, who used the British Indian colonial context to define the subaltern as that section of the population who do not belong to the elite class. So, for Guho, subaltern is whatever is not elite, right? But then what is elite? Well, according to Guho, within the colonial context, the social elite is constituted not only of the European colonizers, but also of the dominant indigenous groups who have access to hegemony, either through their association with the colonial government or through their western style education, or in case of uh, big landowners for instance, or industrial and mercantile bourgeois through their wealth. The subaltern represents the rest of the population, which unlike the elite, do not have political or economic agency. So, here what we need to note is that the subaltern um, is defined not as a specific social class, rather the subaltern is defined simply as a negative space, as a negative social space. It is a site of lack, uh, where there is no sense of agency or no sense of a distinctive identity, right? The subaltern is therefore a position of absolute social disempowerment and Spivak argues that it is a position from which speech is not possible. Now, this statement that the subaltern cannot speak which is actually the answer to the question that is posited at the title of the essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, might at first strike as somewhat uh, banal because it seems to suggest that any person without political economic agency uh, and without a sense of distinctive identity, class identity is dumb. But the real depth of Spivak's argument becomes evident if we read speech as discourse. So, in other words, what I am saying is that Spivak's argument starts making eminent sense if we consider speech not just as utterances, but as meaningful utterances, which if you remember was how we defined discourse in uh, some of our earlier lectures. So, the argument here is that the subaltern is not dumb or speechless in any physical sense, rather the subaltern is someone who cannot generate discourse, who cannot generate meaningful utterances. Uh, 
And the reason why the subaltern who lacks political or economic agency within a society cannot generate a discourse is not very difficult to understand. Now, as you will remember from our earlier discussion on Michel Foucault, within any given social milieu, there are certain important factors that regulate if an utterance is to be considered meaningful or not. And one of the most important conditions which regulate this is the condition of institutional ratification. So, any utterance that is for instance not ratified by institutions like um, schools, colleges, uh, publishing industry, the news agencies, learned societies, libraries is not regarded as discourse. Now, these are also precisely the institutions through which the dominant class or the elite class assert their agency and their control over the society. So, these are the institutions through which hegemony is exerted. So, uh, these institutions uh, needless to say almost exclusively ratify the speech or the utterances of the dominant or the elite class. The subaltern on the other hand who by definition does not have any agency within the society cannot generate a discourse because their speech does not receive institutional ratification. Their speech is not ratified by these various institutions through which hegemony is otherwise exercised, hegemony of the elite class. So, this is why in a colonial society someone like a landless peasant for instance or an illiterate tribal who occupies the position of absolute disempowerment cannot generate a discourse. So, in Spivak's terminology, a landless peasant or an illiterate tribal uh, would be a subaltern who cannot speak. So, this therefore brings us to a whole new aspect of postcolonial theory. With side, we had seen how the colonial discourse uh, can be dismantled through contrapuntal reading. With Bhabha, we have seen how sections of the colonized subject who imitates the colonizer can assert their agency through the menace of mimicry. With Spivak, we encounter the fact that a vast section of the post-colonial society is bereft of agency and bereft of agency to the point that they cannot even generate their own discourse neither can they assert their own distinctive identity. It is uh, important to uh, note here that uh, this understanding leads to social activism as far as Spivak is concerned. So, Spivak's engagement with this post-colonial position of disempowerment takes on the form of activism. And this is a very specific characteristic of the work of certain theorists like Spivak for instance or like Edward Said. Um, we have not talked about it, but Edward Said not just theorized colonialism, but also made it a part of his uh, anti-Israeli activism, right? because he considered the state of Israel to be a colonial state. And even in Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, we see that kind of activism coming from theorization. So, the goal for Spivak becomes not merely to theorize the speechlessness of the subaltern position, but to create, as I have mentioned before, enabling conditions through which the subaltern can emerge from their position of disempowerment and start speaking for themselves. And this is precisely what Spivak has been trying to do through her teacher training program in some of the poorest parts of the Indian state of West Bengal.
So with this, uh, we uh, wrap up our discussion on postcolonial theory. But before bidding uh, you goodbye, I would once again remind you that if you find any of the topics that I have discussed in the two lectures on postcolonialism here to be cryptic or to be difficult, please listen to the lectures of my uh, 10 hour NPTEL course on postcolonial literature, which is available online. There I have uh, dealt with all of these topics in a much more elaborate manner. Goodbye.